Hey friends, we're getting ready to go into the service and have a wonderful time. We believe God is going to meet us in that place. The atmosphere is set, praise and worship. The energy is high. I'm ready to go. God has spoken and now it's time to go speak to the people. Let's go. Let's get ready. Go in and let's have a good time. God bless you. I'll see you on this side. Best praise. If somebody would open their mouth and begin to give God their best praise. Your hallelujah is good enough. It's sufficient. It's the one word that every nation around the world understands. It is hallelujah to the most high God. And we celebrate him. Come on, I need your energy in the building. He deserves my best praise. Some people suffer house fires, but it wasn't me. Some people lost a loved one, but it wasn't me. Some people lost somebody in their neighborhood, but it wasn't my house. So I'm just grateful because somebody's walking through a fire right now that I have the pleasure not to walk through because of his goodness. So for that reason, for the first Sunday, I'm going to give him the best praise right out the gate. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hey, my feet shall stand within thy gates, O oh, Jerusalem. Come on, some people here. The daughter of Zion is in the building. If you would open up your mouth and let her travail out this morning. Because he alone is worthy of my best praise. Some folks had a mental breakdown in, 19, in 2019. Some, some people had, had, a, had, had a nervous breakdown, but God kept me. He kept my mind. Some people pulled over and gave up on their destiny but not me God kept me God kept you and for that reason we ought to praise his name this morning come on celebrate him celebrate him celebrate him he's the shifter in the room don't matter what it will look like in 19 2019 he can shift it for 20 I believe the shifter shifting it in my favor anybody believe that besides me I believe the redeemer yet lives He's breathing on some old stuff that I thought was dead, that I buried and threw away, but he's bringing life back to it. Anybody besides me? He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. And for that, I celebrate his holy name. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. My rock and my redeemer. Amen. Glory to God. Listen, if this have any indication, you know, I was looking around, I say, wow. Quite a few people took the first Sunday of the year off. First Sunday, how you start is awfully, awfully important. And then I looked around again and I said, well, if this any indication of how the year is going to be, um, listen, it's going to be awesome. Not that the people may have been absent but the city mayor and first lady of the city in the building in the building in the building amen let's celebrate our mayor our first lady of the city amen Why you doing it? I'm gonna help you take your seat. I'm gonna allow you to take your seat in just a second. Why you doing it? Someone called me this morning. One of our members, they joined our ministry sometime back when we first getting started good. And the, they came here. We saw them one day. We was doing something out in the park called Men Rebuilding Families. And we were doing some stuff out in the park. And we seen this couple sitting over on the bench. And well, then we start talking to them. And after a while, they joined our ministry, became a part of our family. And they tried to surprise me today, but they went to the old building. And they had to call me. Amen. The Jenkins are in here somewhere. Where they are? The Jenkins. There they go. Amen. There they go. In the building. Amen. They're up in Atlanta now. We thank God, amen, for them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We honor you for what you're getting ready to do and what you've already done. We thank you for every person that's present. We thank you, Lord, from the, from the greatest of them to the least of them. We thank you that you counted it, not Robert, that you brought us together incorporated us together for your plan, your will, and your vision, your insight. We pray that what we release today is something that is directly related to what you have us 
to partake in in this day. And we bless you for that. We honor you and we trust you because you're the Abba Father and you're the one who has not failed us. So thank you for allowing us to be a part of 2020. Whatever it is in store for us, we trust you. Today we come together and we incorporate ourselves together just to say, together we trust you. We trust your plan for us. Though we may not see six months up the road and we don't know what's ahead of us, but we know who's gone before us and who has always covered our backside and who has covered us from the sides in which we walk this journey called life. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you're never failing. Your love is never ending. Thank you for the fact that we can call upon your great name and you hear us and you answer us. Thank you. And for that, we celebrate your name as we embark on this new journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you put your hands together and bless him one more time before you take your seat? Give him your best praise. Amen. Amen. I'm going to allow you to take your seat. Usually, we go straight into the word and we read the word. Take me to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to begin to talk first and then we'll get into that. Started last year. This time I was actually in Africa. I was on a plane headed to Africa. I can't remember exactly, but it was close. I know for the first couple of Sundays I was not present because I was in, went to Abuja, Nigeria, and then to Lagos on a, on a trip with Pastor Baker. And so this time I get the opportunity to come and start the first of the year off in 2020. But last year it was in my heart to follow Amen. Pursue some of the things that I see Pastor Baker do as being a spiritual mentor and a spiritual uh, pastor father for, for unto me. And so one of the things that he do every year, he starts out, and he's been doing this for years. He starts out, the first thing he do, align the church as it relates to tithe and offering. And that's one of the most ugliest words in the church. When you talk about tithe and offering, you lose literally sometimes half of the people's attention because of the simple word that finances is such a hard word to try to preach and get over to people within the African-American community. And that's just because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing maybe um, not really understanding the law of seed time and harvest time. And, and when you, you don't have land to farm, you don't really understand how seed work. But God gives us natural principles that actually uh, exemplifies heaven principles. And so my responsibility is now is for the next six weeks, four to six weeks, uh, same as we did last year, is to talk on tithe and offering. So y'all pray for me. Y'all pray for me. Pray for me. Because here's the thing about tithe and offering is, for years, I'll be honest with you, it's been, it's been, uh, it had not been taught properly. We've taught tithe and offering, we gave tithe and offering, and a lot of times it's been fear-based. It's been all about the fact that God's going to curse. But the reality is, tithe was never instituted in order to bring a curse. In fact, God never cursed man. There is nowhere in the Bible where God cursed man. So tithing is not about curse. Tithing is about a relationship. Somebody say relationship. Everything that relates to tithe and offering is about relationships. So I want to take a few moments, about 15 to 20 minutes, to lay a foundation. And I want to take you into the mind of God, the heart of God, the, 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 uh, the thoughts of God. For the next few moments, just to show you just how you fit into this equation and how much God loves you and where tithe and plays in your everyday life. And it is so amazing that the more I read it and the more I look at it, the more my assignment comes to address the issue, God showed new things. And so I want to deal with you from the, from the standpoint of relationship and how tithing is about relationship. Tithing is solely, solely about relationship. It's not about curse. It's not about being cursed. And we talked that for years. If I'm, if I'm honest, I probably said it myself. If we don't tithe, God going to curse you. And most pray preachers probably honestly wouldn't even talk, would, would probably keep you in that same mode and because they know, they, they, because the church has to run off tithe and offering. That's how the church runs. Most churches run off tithe and offering. Unless the church has some types of businesses, it runs off tithe and offerings. And if you're a ministry like ours, we don't do a lot of services. I, I, I don't like afternoon services. You don't have to ever worry about that being a thing that we have to do every week because you will be needing a new pastor. 
I am not going to preach in the morning time and come back every afternoon and preach again. We can do it sometimes, but you don't ever have to worry about us being a church that do two services, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, praise God. I don't like church that much, and I'm the pastor. Okay, y'all quiet. But to be honest, I love God, but I don't want to be here dancing and shouting with you every all day long either. Okay. And I'm just honest. <laughs> I'm not that spiritual. I got a wife and some children, some chores, honey-do lists and all that stuff I gotta go do. I can't stay here all day fooling with you. <laughs> Praise God. And you know how I did with them potluck dinners? They wanna feed you with them potluck dinners and nowadays you can't, you know, nobody wanna eat nobody cooking anyway. So let's just go home. But let me show you the mind of God. Here's how God starts out. Here's what tithing starts out. Despite what you've been taught or what you heard or what you believe, tithing did not start with Abraham. Tithing starts in the very beginning with Adam. When tithing first started, it wasn't set aside normally to just say 10%. But it was something that is set aside that is holy and is consecrated and it belongs to God. Tithe is just 10% of that which belongs to God. But there was also something that belonged to God from the very beginning when Adam was created. But here's God. I love, to, I love to talk about God because God is so amazing that when you really look at him, you see him so different than what they've raised us to think and see him as a God going to get you kind of person. You know, we, we've been so afraid of God and we've made him so distant. And what I hate about the fact that they taught us so much of that is that nowadays, and I'm getting a little bit sidetracked, but, but, now, but nowadays it's a little different, but they taught us that you had to have everything right before you came to church because God was going to get you. So you're supposed to come to church he can, so he can get you right. And so the real heart of God is that God has always been attracted to broken things. God's whole heartbeat has been designed to be, his DNA is, he's designed to be attracted to broken things. He likes things broken. In fact, the Bible says that he searches the broken and contrite spirit to show himself strong and mighty in. So God is always looking for something broken. It's not like you and I. You and I is a little bit different. And we find this in Isaiah 55, where the Bible says that in verse number eight says, you know, uh, our, his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither his ways our way, are our ways his ways. He goes on to tell that there's a difference between how he thinks and what he likes and his ways and our ways. He says there's, a, there's like a vast difference between the way we think and the way he thinks. And so the way he thinks is God is attracted to things that are broken. But now he also attracted to things that, that are broken, but he checks it to make sure it has potential. Now he doesn't want anything that's just broken with no potential. That's what Shaniqua does. I thought y'all would get something out of it, but then y'all didn't lie. Okay. I, Shaniqua sometimes, she go after something that's broken with no potential. But the first thing God does, he's attracted to something called this vast and darkness, this earth that has nothing. It's like this vast nothingness. And it's like it's, it's, it doesn't have any potential on the outside looking in. So the first thing God does, he's attracted to this earth realm, this earth, this, this whole vast nothingness. He goes down, he investigates it. And the Bible says, he says, let there be light. In other words, he turns the light on. And he sees that there is some, or he sees that there's something in this thing called this earth. Now notice that Satan is not interested in it until after it looks beautiful. Nothing wrong with people who make themselves beautiful, but my, be careful that of the tension that comes once you make it or once you start to put some things together in your life and now all your attention now it's not really because you're special they just attracted to the fact that you now have something to offer that they didn't know you had to offer before so you have to be careful some people just around about for what they can get out of you that's a freebie but watch God now he's attracted to this vast nothingness he sees it 
he goes, he turns the light on, and then he begins to divide the waters, and then out of it he calls the seeds to come forth, and it produces harvest, and then he brings the cows, because now they have to eat the grass, and you see, he gets all the way down to where he creates man. Attracted to nothingness, but inside it he sees potential. And in this particular potential, he sees the opportunity to redesign something that looks like heaven, but it's called earth. And so he gets around Genesis 1 and 26, 27, 28, and he creates man, Adam, this man called Adam, and he creates it, and he does something amazing. He then takes Adam and he tells his whole, you know, his entourage, the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, his crew, he says, let them have dominion and power. Now watch this. He's attracted to nothingness. He creates something out of it because it has potential. And then once he created it and now it's beautiful, he said, let man rule it. He, he, it's like he wants a son or a family. And so he brings them to earth. He creates this family in earth. And then when he creates it, he doesn't just create it and then he, he, and let them be or exist, he said, let them have dominion. Let them have power, let them have authority, let them have the ability to be able to replenish. In other words, what he's saying is to, to, to the word, Christ the word and the Holy Spirit, he's saying, take what you have and give it to them. I'm going somewhere, give me about 10 more minutes. He says, take what you have and give it to them. We find there's nothing strange. We find in Luke 10, the 10th chapter, we're about the verse uh, number 18, where it says, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. Verse 19 says, behold, I give unto thee power and authority. That's dunamis and exorcist power. And he says, behold, you know, no serpent or anything shall uh, harm you. He takes what he has. He takes his power. He takes his authority. He takes his ability, his will, and he, play, he puts it inside a man. Because what God wants is, watch this, he sees this nothingness and he, then he sees man, he creates him in his likeness and his image and he wants to allow man to rule earth like he rules heaven. And I can only imagine that, you know, you know, yes, uh, I believe it was Saturday morning I had to get up, well Friday, let's start at Friday. Friday I had to go, my daughter called, she needs to wash and dry, she lives in Atlanta. I, I'm kind of proud of myself right now. I'm glad she's not here. Um, so I can really see, and I'm glad, you know, her boyfriend or whatever he is not here because it's real good. You just give me about two minutes. I'm going to show you how good it is. He, they called and need a wash and dry, right? I go and find one. First, I call, you know, the church snitch. I'll call him the church snitch, but he's a good friend of mine, Minister Chris Martin. I call him. I say, hey, I need a wash and dry. He said he shows me a picture. He finds one, discovers it. I go. I purchase it, put it on a trailer. I take it home. I got to get up the next morning, and I got to go take it. I think, I said, well, wait a minute. I get up there. Atlanta, you can't just go across the street and get something. Send me a picture of your plug. They send me a picture of it. It's not right. I go buy the right one, so I take it up there. I take it up there with a limited amount of tools. But I get there. Oh, boy, I kind of be. Not me. I'm talking about this fella got his eyes on my daughter. Oh, big fella. We got to raise... We gotta take this thing up three floors. They tell me this after I purchase it. We gotta take the wash and dry up three floors. So I'm on the bottom. I take the dollar, he got the pool. He bigger than me, you may as well pull. It's yours anyway. So all I'm doing is helping. I know he's trying to show out. He gets to the first flight, the first floor, to the, you know, to the second floor, and I'm like, you wanna take a rest? He goes, no, I got it. So we turn the corner. He pulling and pulling. So I'm not trying to hurt me. I'm just basically God. I got to preach. <laughs> so we get it all the way to the top. We got to go down and get the other one. Well, they don't know how to hook it up. I do. I, well, I really don't, but I know more than he did. So I hooked it up. And I got everything going to wash and dry. Everything is working right. So what I'm saying is my daughter called me and she needed me. Bro, can't do it. Daddy can't. 
Daddy done show up and show out. But wait a minute now. He been trying to get the battery. Don't y'all say nothing about it if he come now. He been trying to get the battery now, right? Out the car for two months. Or well, at least a month. So once I got the wash and dry, everything working, I'm looking around for Marcus. That's his name. Can't find him nowhere. Guess where he at? He done hurried out to try to hurry him get the battery out of the car before daddy show up because he been struggling to get it out. He want to at least try to look good in front of my daughter. He can't get it. So I get down there to the car and start looking at it. He run to go get some more tools. I said, hey, I got it. <laughs> Looking good. Man, I went up, daddy went up there and showed out. Everything they've been trying to do, I did it in one day. They took me out to eat and gave me a chainsaw, praise God. I'm satisfied. Okay. But my point being, watch this now. As a father, I'm seeing my daughter, you know, and... I want to be there to help and I'm watching her grow and I'm watching her become me, come become us. And so here it is with God, he creates this vast nothingness, he gives life to it and he's watching Adam become him. And so he's assisting Adam and trying to help Adam become like him. And so the first thing you do, you give them power. And then he gives them resources, he gives them ability. And so that's what God does. He gives, he gives us resources, he gives us power, he gives us ability. And now, so it was with my daughter. I gave her ability, I gave her power, I gave her resources. But when she can't do it, I come in, I take care of it, I go back to my place. Because it's about relationship. We're in relationship together. And because we're in relationship together, she have access to everything I have. And so whatever it takes for me to get to her and to take care of her needs, I'm coming. I didn't want to drive to Atlanta to go take two washing machines, wash me in the dry in the rain. Hauled up three flights of stairs, unhook the lines, hook them back up, take the cars out, take the wires loose, plug it back in. I thought I might get electrocuted because I didn't know what I was doing but it did work my point being I didn't want to do it it wasn't on the top of my list but because of the relationship if daddy is needed if Abba's father is needed is a responsibility because of relationship I gotta go whether I want to go or not and so here it is with God he creates something and he wanted to become just like him how do you know? Because even Jesus says, when they ask him, how should we pray? In Matthew chapter 6, he says, pray this prayer. He says, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants it to look just like heaven. And so here he is, this amazing father that's attracted to this nothingness. But it has potential. And he began to build on the potential because he want relationship. He want to be heir by father. In fact, if we never call upon him, he ceased to exist. He, 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 he ceased to exist as his purpose in our lives. Because he's only in existence as purpose in our life is to become heir by father. The one who provides. He's our patron, our financer, the one who's involved in our affairs. And so he creates an opportunity for him to become Abba's father. He starts with Adam. And he's so uh, awesome that even after he gives Adam, watch this, he creates him. And he says to Adam, before he puts Adam in it, he says he created man. So if he just said Adam, he gave Adam the power. Everything would rest, would, would rest on Adam to be able to transfer all of God's ability, all of God's DNA, all of God's goodness over to who he wanted it to. But he did not do that in his, in his infinite wisdom. God says he created man. And inside of man, 
man, both male and female, and he says, let them. He did not identify it, neither as a uh, single it out as Adam, because you have to understand his power of, and a magnitude of his ability to be able to do things. Even when Jesus gets to the Lazarus tomb, he can't just say, dead come alive, because everything that was dead will come alive. He has the power to bring things to life. So he has to say, Lazarus, and he has to be specific. That's why I love about you can't get my blessing, because when it's mine, he's specific, because if he just say blessing, everybody in the neighborhood gets it. He can't just say blessing. He has to say Frank's blessing because Frank get to get it. So watch his wisdom and his ability to be able. Take me to verse, I believe, 14. Let's see what verse 14 has to offer us. It says, in the name of the Lord. That's verse 14. Where am I at? I'm on 18. Let me back up to 14. Praise God. Let me back up. Let me back up. Y'all get some out of this so far? Amen. Let's go to 15. And the Lord God took the man. This is Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden and dre to dress it and to keep it. Now he's created him in Genesis 1 and 2. Now he gives, he, 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 he's so awesome that even though, you know, if you go back up a, a few verses, he gives them four streams of uh, income. Uh -huh. And now he gets to write this now. He hadn't given them keys yet. He goes and he builds a house east of Eden, a place called Delight. Not stress. Not pressure, delight. It means delight. It means a place where pleasure abides. He puts it east of Eden, he puts Adam into this particular place and he wants him to dress it and to keep it. He gives him a purpose. He gives him an assignment to work. But he doesn't have to work hard because he just told him that I give you four rivers. And out of these four rivers, it breaks, this one river, it breaks into four streams. And it has gold, it has diamond, it has sapphire, it has crystals. Not any kind of gold. The Bible says it has the best, the finer gold inside of it. And now he gets to verse 15 and 16. He says, and the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely. Here's what relationships are tested. I give you four streams. I've given you a river that breaks up and it waters the garden for you. All you have to do is be a good steward over what I put in you. And I didn't put you in a stressful situation. I put you in a place called delight. I put you in a place called pleasure. I gave you something that you don't have to be worrying about and stressing over. In fact, when Adam, the first house ever came, the first place ever built was debt free. Man, I'm teaching better than y'all. Amen, man. The first house was, was debt free. Adam gets a home that's debt free. His Abba father gives him the home debt free. Somebody say debt free. And he says, all you have to do is till the ground and keep it, which means that you got to shimmer. You have to protect it. It's already designed to water itself. And he says that whatever Adam calls it, it shall become. Notice the power of Adam. Whatever he calls anything, it shall be. Amen. God gives him the same power, the same authority, the same ability, the same access as he, that, that he has. In fact, he says, give it to him. Because we're in relationship. We're in covenant. And because they're in covenant, he don't have to work for much. It's already provided. He just had to steward what's already there, which means he had to properly manage it. As if it's his own, but it doesn't belong to him. You just have to manage it like it's yours, but it don't belong to you, but you get the benefits of it. And here's what he tells them. He says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. I'm going to allow you to eat what's in the garden. Next verse. But of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me. And then God creates man a woman. Best thing God ever done, praise God, was give a man a woman. I can preach right there for a little while. I can raise a hymn when you're talking about my woman. And they say, I can't talk about your woman, but I can sure talk about mine. Let me stop playing and get on to it. <laughs> but watch this, though. Y'all excuse me if you visit I like to have fun. But watch this now. He gives him a job called stewardship. He's already laid everything out. Everything takes care of itself. You just watch over it and keep it. It's not yours, but you can have access to it. Now it gets down to the nitty gritty. He says to him, in my closing. <laughs> down to two. In my closing, he says to Adam, he says, you can eat all this fruit trees. I only want one. So he set aside this one tree called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, any other tree, Adam, you have access to. I don't care how much of it you eat, it's yours, you can have it. But this one particular thing is consecrated, it's set aside, don't bother with it. It is the first place we see where God has set something aside for God's own pleasure. That man is not required to touch. But he can have everything else, not every relationship. So God gives man plenty. He only wants one tree. Man can have all the other trees. That's an awesome, that's an awesome, I don't even know where it would be. Assignment wouldn't be the right word, but that, you know, you, it's, it's hard, that's an awesome deal. I mean, it's just hard. To, to, to argue that when you've already gotten something for free, you got a place called delight, it takes care of itself, you just manage it and whatever you say goes. You can have all the trees in the garden, but there's one you can't have that's mine, don't bother with it. And here comes Satan. And the first thing he introduces them to is the one thing that God don't want them to touch. And so now he wasn't even interested in it. So God has beautified it. He has made it something. That's why you have to be careful. I told, I'm telling you that when you really arrive at a place and folks start giving you attention. Because it's probably not about how nice you look or how well things are going for you. Maybe there's a hidden agenda. Because there's something about envy and Satan was showing the signs, the first sign of envy was right here because he didn't want the tree, he didn't want the gold, he didn't want the crystals, he didn't want any of that stuff. He had all of that. Isaiah and Ezekiel, I believe it says, that he was stripped of all of that. He didn't even go back trying to get it. The problem with envy is he didn't want Adam and Eve to have it. He didn't even want it. That's just like you get a new car and people don't even want your new car. They just don't want you to have the new car. That's envy. They don't even want your little house. They got a better house, a bigger house. They just don't want you to get the house. That's envy. And so here's the first sign of envy, but here's what happens is, you know the story, he eats the, the fruit. And the first thing he do is watch relationship. The Bible says when he ate the fruit, his eyes popped open, he runs and hides, and he covers himself with fig leaves because he realized he's naked. What happened to the relationship before when the Bible said that God would come and visit Adam in the cool of the day and they would fellowship together and all of a sudden, now that he's taking what is God, he now realized that there is something has been affected between the relationship of him and the father because what the father had offered him and gave him, you just couldn't argue with, but he took more. And now that he's taking more, what has happened is it broke relationship. And so now God comes looking for him. He's hiding. 
He's somewhere hiding behind a fig tree. And now he's hiding behind a fig tree. God begins to call him, Adam, where art thou? Adam, where are you? God still wants relationship, but Adam has hid because he's gone beyond the place where he's been required to go and he knows it. One thing about tithing is that when you're a tither and you're a believer, you know and understand the system. When you don't tithe, you know it. There's a thing called conviction. Adam had conviction and condemnation. And he went and hid himself because he knew he had a good, good benefits. And here's a covenant relationship behind it. Everything that God had, Adam, you know, he gave it to Adam. You can have it, everything but the tree. So he gets a tree. He's hiding now. God shows up. And God begins to curse everything. He gets to man. And here's where it counts. Because man is the real seed carrier. And every child comes from a man. Not a woman. Thank you for your womb that carries it. But we walk around with it. But watch this. He gets to man and he says, I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. And then they have a meeting in heaven and he says to them, the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have a meeting. And he said, we better get them out. At least they live forever in this state. Which means... They're out of order, and if we don't get them out, and they get and they eat the tree of life, they'll live forever in this order, this function. So they drive them out of the garden and put cherubims around the garden to ensure that Adam could not come in. But here's the reason why I came to tell you tithing is so important. He's one tree that he wasn't supposed to. Now he's out of the garden that was his. God did not curse him. He cursed the ground. And he says this to Adam. He says, from here on out you shall work by the sweat of your brow. And if you don't understand what it means for him to curse the ground, and the ground is what produces the harvest. He says, from here on out, because of what you've done, because you touched the part that was mine, he says, you're going to have to work hard for harvest when you had harvest that would just yield itself one after the other. The blessing was on you to yield fruit after fruit after fruit. But because you did not yield, you know, to my work, words or you yield to the words of the enemy he says to him you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow which means that it's not impossible to prosper it's not impossible to do well it's not impossible to get a car or a house or any of those things it's not impossible but he said you can't get it by the same grace that you had when you was in relationship with me He didn't say you couldn't have it. He just said it won't be the same without me because now you got to work at it. You see, because with God, God gives God-like kind of ideas. God gives God-like kind of strategies. God gives God-like kind of plans and insight and wisdom. And so God gives wisdom to people who's in relationship with him. And so he says, since we're out of relationship, when he touched that what belonged to God, they separated in relationship. And here's my final thing that i got to share with you before I go. What he was saying was to God when he ate the tree of the tree that he wasn't supposed to, he says to him, I want to do it my way. I know you gave me a river that yields great valuables. I know you gave me a, a place called delight, Eden, that's just pleasure. I know you gave it all to me, and I understand that. But I want to do it my way. I want to see it my own way. I want to see it the way, you know, I can see it. I want to kind of examine it. I want to walk it my way. In other words, I, I want to preserve my own life. I want to be my own provider. I understand what you're doing. I get that. But I want to try it myself. 
Anybody ever got any children? Every now and again, you run across one that I don't care what you try to tell them, they want to do it themselves. You can be all the ever father you want to be, but they have that personality that they want to do it themselves. I never get our oldest daughter. I'm trying to tell her about finances. I'm going to hook up with my credit card. I'm going to put on this so I can teach you how to build a credit. She tells me the exact words. Dad, I want to do it myself. I leaned back in the seat. I was mad as fire. Because I already know you don't even understand what you're about to walk into. You don't even know what's around the corner. You don't know how easy it is to step out there and everything going well and all of a sudden life side swipes you and knocks you out clean out of the race. You don't know the danger of what you just said. But because she wanted to do herself and she's now out of high school and in college, I have to back up and let her have it. Because she want to do it herself. And that's what Adam was saying and Eve was saying, I want to do it myself. That's what we say when we don't want to partner with God in the area of tithing. We want to do it ourselves. It didn't take long for me to call and say, well, how's that going for you? Okay. Because I knew you couldn't do it yourself. And neither can you do it yourself. And I can't do it myself. It has been designed before the foundation of the world. God wanted partnership. And his partnership is not burdensome. God says, I'll give you 90% of whatever it is you want. But give me 10% just to keep us in relationship. I'll take one penny out of every dime. One dime out of every dollar. One dollar every 10. One 10 out of every 100. 100 out of every 1,000. If you'll just give me just that little bit so we can be in partnership, I want to be able by father I want to be involved I want to be able to come in but you got to show me that you trust me as that by father and it's not hard to show me you trust me just one penny out of a dime proves to me that you trust me and you don't have to do it by yourself Because you can't do it by yourself. You need God. I need him. It's been designed for us to stay in partnership with him. And in relationship. Tithing was not about to curse. God didn't come to curse us. Tithing is a blessing. And a privilege. Because it allows us to partner with the Holy God. Just partnership. So I laugh at people who say, tithing is just Old Testament. I know they didn't read the Bible because it's in three places in the New Testament. I laugh at people who say, well, he was just talking about animals and cows because they don't understand the word called evolving. Because life evolves. Currency changes. We don't even have the same money like we had uh, over 100 years ago or so. It looks different. It evolves. But here's the thing. It was about relationship. A small price to pay for an awesome relationship. Come on, stand to your feet. It was about relationship. It wasn't about a curse. It wasn't about a preacher preaching to you that you're gonna, if you don't pay your tithe, you're gonna, you're gonna be, you know, you know, you you gonna mess around and lose everything you have and all of those things. That is not in God's heart for you to lose everything you have. He didn't create you to curse you. In fact, he didn't even create hell for you. But the Bible says it does enlarge itself. But it wasn't for you. Failure not for you. Everything that belongs, that failure, that's attached to failure is a sign to darkness. The problem is sometimes we don't know how to choose the right part. And it's enticing as it is, 
Wisdom is the principal thing. I'm wise enough to know I can't do it without him. I need him. I don't know about my neighbor down the road now. I can't say about them. Maybe they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Or a gold spoon. I don't know about them, but I know about my situation. And if I look at my life, I need him. I, 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 need, I need the partnership. I need a relationship. I need him to cover me when I can't cover myself. So I'm careful in that area. And I, if I'm honest, I don't always like tithing. I don't know nobody who do. Especially when you don't have a lot. But I understand the wisdom in it is. It is better for me to partner with God than not partner with God. And so by building relationship, it was one small thing that God used. And nothing changed until he took and tried to have a part of what was God's. And when he done that, everything that he had changed. He had to now work for it. This 2020, I'm believing God. Come on, grab your neighbor by the hand. This 2020, I'm believing God. That this is going to be one of the greatest partnership years we ever had. Me and my Abba Father. You ought to start talking to him for yourself. This is going to be one of the greatest years because there's some things I want to do. I want to partner with God so much so when I'm talking to God, I need you to talk to God based on your own. I enjoy my wife being home with me on holidays. I need her home with me all the time. I need the books inside of me to come alive. I need businesses that won't require all of my time. I need strategies this year. I need divine wisdom. I need, I need insight. I need places and opportunities. I need networking. I'm telling God what I need. I need you to tell God what you need. In this partnership, I need God to, to, to order my steps in 2020. I need God to ordain my steps this year. I want a powerful partnership. I want it to be so much so that it do like my Malachi says, that it causes people to look upon me and be jealous of my God and want my God. That's the kind of partnership God wants with you. I pray over your life today that everything you open in your mouth and telling and talking to your God about that you want to partner with him on, that heavens are record, recording it right now. That the angelic hosts have been assigned you according to Psalms 103 and Psalm 91. Reaching for yourself. God assigned angels to you to watch over you to assure that you don't stumble. I'm praying that they're hearing every word that comes out of your mouth. And so it was with Jacob when he saw the ladder and, and angels ascending and descending into the heavens. And God was standing at the edge of the ladder and he was watching and carrying over every word. That as you're opening your mouth and you're telling God about the partnership that you want with him in 2020. That angels are recording it and heavens are orchestrating it and they're lining things up so that you get a chance to see everything this year through the power of partnership with God. Father, we thank you right now for the power of partnership. I don't believe we're here by incident or accident, but by divine appointment that you ordained us to be here today for this particular message. That the power of this partnership would be so great that it falls upon our children and our children's children for a thousand generations. Let the spirit of poverty, the spirit of failure, the spirit of brokenness, the spirit, the spirit of dysfunction, the spirit of failure, the spirit of depression be forever broken off my family because of the power of our partnership. Let what rests upon my children is a peace 
that surpasses all understanding and may it guard their heart and their mind. In the mighty name of Jesus, I speak to those deep dreams. I speak to those passions. I speak to those desires. I strip malls. I speak to th movie theaters. I speak to subdivisions. I'm speaking it to come out and snatching it out. That this year God give you the connections you need. I'm speaking to the boardroom where God aligned the room with the people with an ego mindset that can think like you and talk like you and value the same ideals that you value and the same dreams that you value. I believe that partnership is happening for you. In fact, there's even higher levels for you. There's higher levels. Your last race is not run. There's higher levels. In the power of partnership, in the immaculate name of our Savior, I pray. Celebrate your God. Greetings, friends. What an awesome privilege it was to have you to join us today. We're so excited to have you tune in. I believe by faith that you got a word today that God bless your spirit just like he blessed us. Listen, I want to take this opportunity to invite you out. I know you're watching from different places around the country, but listen, if you're ever in our Douglas, Georgia area, stop in. We want to see exactly who it is that's viewing us. We want to meet you face to face. We've been known to love people without any limitations. That's just who we are. So if you're in the area, stop by and see us. Meet us, the whole staff. We're ready to meet you. And I want to also invite you to become a partner with us. On the screen, you'll see something that, that allows you to become a partner. If you would, just follow simple instructions if God leads you to do so. We believe there's another new generation that's on the rise, and we want to be a part of it. So hey, look, if you're a part of that new generation, that new church that's ready to take the gospel to the nation, then we want you to come and be a part of it. And don't forget to come by and see us face to face. Again, I'm Pastor Frank Busser, and it was always a pleasure to have you tune in with us. Come see us, same place, same time next week, and don't forget to tell a friend. God bless you.